Thank you everyone for joining us today, whether that's live or remotely afterwards. And Brent, thank you so much for taking the time to have this conversation with me and the Interdimension community. I I'm usually sure. will start off by going over people's bios and sharing some of their experience. But you know, what I was thinking about as we were coming into this conversation is just how much I have enjoyed my personal time with you, Brent that above and beyond getting to sit on set and watch your awe-inspiring practice unfold. For those of you that are tuning in, one of the things that are, is the most fun for myself and Travis is that we will watch the crew watch Brent and their faces are like, as he does these miraculous things with his body, but he does them, as all of you know, with such deep, equanimity and it is the embodiment of what we talk about with yoga this idea of sukha that there's um an ease and a welcomeness but more than anything i think about the yoga that unfolds each and every time i have a conversation with you brent because every time we're in conversation it feels like the practice of yoga and i feel like i walk away from those conversations having spoken to something within the yamas or the niyamas that there is something about what we end up sharing that feels like the expression of the living practice so thank you because i'm excited to share that aspect of you with the community as well as the deep humility that you bring to every moment and every interaction so i thought one of the great ways to start might be having you tell the community yourself about your experience with yoga you know how did you come to have the practice that you have how did you come to find yoga how did you get to where you are today and to really just let you tell your yogic story sure i'm happy to um but first i just want to say thank you for that um because i feel the same way uh, i feel like it's really uh, it's a pleasure to be able to talk uh, to people who have uh, have studied and who have a you know a daily practice of yoga because I feel like it's almost like a, I don't know it's like a secret club or something it's like people who like to ride motorcycles or people who like tattoos or something there's just like you know there's there's a connection that goes deeper than the average interaction and um, I'm really grateful to have that with you and Travis and the rest of the interdimension family and um, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be able to teach on the platform and be here today. So thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, my story, um, I, I've tried to figure it out over the years because there's an element of it that's still kind of a mystery to me. Um, I was uh, 34 years old when I took my first yoga class and um, I was not, I didn't have any expectations. Um, my girlfriend at the time said that she thought I would enjoy it. Um, we were kind of, it wasn't a great relationship. We were fighting a lot. Um, but we agreed to go to a yoga class one day and we had ended up getting in a fight that morning. Uh, I'll never forget. It was a Sunday morning um, and we were, we were going to bail on the class, but then we said, no, we, we just, we committed to this. We're going to go. So we went to the class and at the, at the beginning of the class, the teacher said, um, set an intention. And I had never had anybody say that to me in any context whatsoever, let alone in the context of something that I was going to as um, thinking it was just exercise. And so I set an intention to release myself from whatever weight, whatever stress, whatever discontent was weighing on me. And somehow yoga worked its magic like it so often does. Uh, and by the end of the class, I just felt light, you know, and it was the first time that I in my life, really, that I had a conscious awareness of feeling light like that. And uh, it was like, wow, there's something to this. Um, this is this is weird. So I went back uh, a week later and I had a similar experience. And I went back uh, one week after that. So I went to three classes in three weeks and each time I loved it. And then um, I went on a camping trip uh, and my girlfriend was, she caught a cold. So she was basically like laying in the tent, you know, sniffling and not feeling so great. And so, uh, I, at some point I went and I said, I think I'm going to go practice a little bit of yoga. We were in the woods in Big Sur. Um, and I went and found uh, this little spot in the woods uh, where there was a reasonably level piece of ground next to a river and the sunlight was glistening through the trees. And 
it was just, you know, completely idyllic. And I just started doing whatever I knew how to do. I was going through sun salutations. I was doing warrior poses. I didn't know that much, um, but I was breathing and doing the best I could to sort of um, engage with what felt like a practice. And at some point, uh, I just had a feeling that I should learn how to teach yoga. Um, and so I decided, you know, when I got home, I Googled uh, yoga certification. I didn't even know the words teacher training existed. And um, the first thing that came up was a program in Bali with a school called Radiantly Alive. And um, I had always wanted to go to Bali because I like to surf. So I had sort of thought of Bali as a surfing destination. So this thing came up and um, I looked at the program and, you know, it seemed cool to me. I didn't know anything really about what to look for in a teacher training. But I went to the woman who ran the studio that where I had gone to those three classes. And I said, do you know about this program? Because in my mind, I was just thinking like all yoga teachers probably know about all certification programs. <laughs> and she was like, I have no idea, but it looks amazing. And I wish I could go. And so that was all I needed to hear. I was like, OK, I'm in. And, you know, I have to say, like, I was very fortunate because at the time, you know, I was my career was was stalled. I was working on a screenwriting career. Um, I had I had had two films made, but neither of them did very well. And um, I wasn't really making any headway selling any more scripts. Um, and so I didn't really have any money, but fortunately when my grandmother had passed away, I think it was a year or two before she had left me just a little bit of money. And without that, I wouldn't have been able to go to Bali and do the training because I think it cost about six or $7,000. And that was money I just didn't have on my own. And that was kind of, you know, at the time that was an important thing for me to acknowledge because I was always very prideful about doing things on my own and not needing help. Um, and sort of accepting and acknowledging that I needed help and accepting that help um, went a long way. It was an important piece of my yoga journey because this whole thing is about helping other people and being of service, um, which I was fortunate enough to attend a training where they emphasize that. Um, and so I, it, just, it was the beginning of a whole shift in my outlook on life and my perspective of who I was and what I was doing here and what I wanted out of life. And I mean, it, like that was 13 years ago and it was October of 2010. The, the program started on my on the day of my 35th birthday. And, um, you know, pretty much overnight, things started changing for me. Um, I just I, I made different choices about, you know, how I wanted to spend my time, who I wanted to spend it with. Um, you know, I didn't think of yoga at that point as a career. Uh, I was thinking of it as something I could do on the side to make a little bit of extra income. Um, while I was still working on what at the time were my screenwriting dreams. Um, but I began to notice pretty quickly that the more I gave myself to teaching and practicing, the more everything sort of was working out. Um, you know, I would just, I would say yes to every opportunity I could to teach, even if it meant driving, you know, an hour across town at six o'clock in the morning uh, to teach a class of two or three people. I was just, I decided to commit to it. And, you know, that led to more classes at other studios and all of that led to teaching privates and that led to, you know, leading retreats and little by little things just, you know, started building until within a year I was teaching full time. And, you know, it took a long time for me to um, sort of embrace that yoga was not just my path personally, but my path professionally, um, because I was attached to this dream of writing screenplays and it's funny because i look back and i don't even know why <laughs> you know? Um, i mean i love the idea of telling stories and i love the idea of, of being able to inspire people and move people um, but those are things that you do through teaching yoga and so it's it's it was so interesting because all of the things that i was hoping would happen as a screenwriter in terms of you know success and opportunities None of those things were happening screenwriting, but they were all happening yoga wise. And so it was just kind of like a very clear, uh, you know, invitation from the good old universe to uh, pay attention and, and move in a different direction than I had previously been going. And, you know, that was kind of it. One thing led to another and here we are. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. I hear so much of my own story reflected in that, you know, similarly, I did my training and I thought for years, like, 
this will be something I do on the side or in my mind, it was when I retire, I will teach yoga and embrace this at that point in time. And I would be at my desk, but I would be on yogajournal.com. You know, I was spending all of my time and in that capacity until finally it was like the universe pushed me and, and it was what I was doing and it was what I was meant to do. And similarly, I grew up as a storyteller and teaching yoga, you get to take people on this journey, but you're facilitating it, but they have to go on it, right? There, it's it's a choice for a student to engage in that practice and, and for them to go on, on their own unique journey with it. So thank you so much for that. You know, one of the things I, I know for myself in just getting to be a sideline witness to the unfolding of your physical practice is your physical aptitude, um, which is a combination of flexibility and incredible strength. Were you always like that? Or, you know, what were you born that way? Was it something that came from practice? Did, were you an, did you have any physical capacity beforehand? I think that that is so interesting, you know, walking into a room at 34, you know, your body's pretty well established or has certain conditions, um, that it's been under from how we've shown up in life. So curious about how that that component unfolded for you. Yeah, it's a great question. And this is part of the mystery for me because um, I'm trying to think of where to begin this story. So when I was about eight or nine years old, I can't remember exactly when, but um, there was a doctor. I think I went in for like a routine physical exam and the doctor told me and my parents that I have a little bit of scoliosis. So the doctor said here and he gave me a, one sheet of paper with some exercises on it. He said, you should do these exercises to help strengthen your core and you know stabilize your spine. And so I started doing these exercises and the doctor was specific. He said, you're probably not gonna wanna do them. They're gonna be hard, you know, but you should, it's really important that you do this for your, you know, your health when you get older. He's like, I know that doesn't mean anything to you now, but trust me, you're gonna wanna do this. So I would do them and I really enjoyed it. I was like, oh, this is fun. And it wasn't until I started practicing, you know, uh, officially that I realized that it was all yoga poses. It was a lot of stuff from the Ashtanga primary series. It was a lot of like seated forward folds and boat poses and things like that. But I didn't know that. I didn't like I didn't make that connection in that first class. But I realized later, um, you know, so I had been doing those exercises from that time that the doctor gave them to me uh, for probably like. I don't know, three or four years at least when I was a little kid. And then I started playing sports. I started playing basketball. Um, when I got into middle school, I started playing football. Um, I was always active. I liked using my body. Like I did, I definitely came into the world uh, like actively oriented. Um, and I stopped doing the exercises that the doctor had given me, um, you know, because I was working out with my teammates and practicing and doing all that stuff with my sports. But then when I got out of college, I played football for two years in college. I didn't really enjoy the experience. So I only played my first two years and then I stopped. I was never really a gym person. Like I, I wasn't going to the gym to lift weights. I wasn't running on a treadmill. So I went back to uh, those exercises that the doctor had given me when I was a kid. And I was just kind of doing them on my own, um, you know, like in the mornings before I would go to class or, you know, whenever I could. Um, and then when I got out of college and I was working at a radio station for a while, and I would just, I remember I would get up in the mornings and I would do these kinds of movements, but I had no concept that, that it was yoga related. I didn't even know the word yoga existed. So when I went to the first class years later, uh, the teacher came up to me actually at the end of class and she said, you have such a beautiful practice. <laughs> And my girlfriend at the time, she goes, uh, it's his first class. Because I was like, I don't even know what that means. I don't even know what it means to have a practice. Like, I've never heard this term before. And um, the teacher's like, what do you mean first time? That Like, first time at this studio? And I said, no, this is my first yoga class. She's like, that doesn't make sense. That's like, you're doing things that it takes people a lifetime to learn how to do. And as I think back, I mean, we were doing like maybe side crow or something like that. I'm not really sure exactly what was, um, what she was so impressed by. <laughs> I mean, I know side crow is not like, you know, easy, but at the same time, as I think about kind of like what I've learned to do since then, you know, it's all relative. So side crow starts to seem sort of like, of course I could do side crow, you know what I mean? But I recognize that not everybody walks into a yoga class uh, feeling that way. So yes, I was athletically inclined. Um, you know, I like to surf, I like to skateboard. Um, I like to use my body, but I never thought of it as something that I was doing for, um, 
my mental health. And it's only through practicing yoga that that, um, that, that sort of connection clicked for me. Uh, and I realized how important movement and exercise in general is to just functioning well as a human being, especially as you get older and life stresses pile up with, you know, whatever it is, work and bills and family and yada, yada. Um, just the importance of having a practice to be able to take care of yourself on the inside uh, rather than just on the outside. Beautiful. Well, and it sounds like, um, you know, for those of us that maybe have an inclination toward believing in past lives, maybe you're just a reincarnated yogi. I, I think about this because, you know, I know like people would talk about past lives before I started practicing yoga and I would just kind of roll my eyes and think that's, you know, nonsense. Um, but I don't think that anymore because I think about this whole scoliosis thing and it's, it's a mild case, but I started thinking, well, why do I have scoliosis? Like, how did I come into this world with scoliosis? And there's a part of me, like, it just, I didn't even I really think about this. It was just like, intuitively, I was like, oh, well, I used to be a yogi, but I like either got cocky or I got lazy or whatever it was. And I, I just had this vision that I was like walking home one night after like, I don't know, drinking or something at a tavern and getting jumped on the road home and like the, whoever they were, the bandits, they like kicked me and they, 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 you know, made my spine crooked. So when I woke up in this life, I came into it with a crooked spine so that I could then make my way back to yoga in earnest this time. Beautiful. I Maybe I can write a <laughs> screenplay about that at some point. Yeah. I mean, and I think it's amazing the way that you know, whether we come to this practice, there's something else, you know, we do have innate talents. And we see that in, in children, you know, we have innate things that we're skillful at. Um, and also those skills can be built, which is so much of what you teach, you know, we had put out, you had created two classes for interdimension TV building blocks, part one and building blocks part two. And one of the things that we had heard Interdimension TV members, you guys that are here joining us today, had shared is we want more practices building toward advanced asana. And that that terminology in and of itself is an interesting conversation that I'm sure you have some things to say about. Well, but we, there have was blog this, post, we have a blog post coming out about that soon, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, this idea, so on on one hand, I want to pin and have a conversation about what does it what does advanced asana advanced pose or posture really mean and we also as an interdimension tv community wanted to meet those of you who were interested in exploring some of these more complex postures within the body and so brent has a new series coming out that is five brand new 45 minute classes building towards specific what we're referring to as peak poses. So you could call them advanced asanas, but they are classes that specifically help you build consciously, safely, physiologically, muscularly, but also emotionally and mentally toward these peak poses. So, you know, I would love to hear from you, Brent, for you, what does advanced asana mean? And then how did you conceptualize and create this upcoming series? And what can people expect from this series? Yeah, so I mean, advanced asana to me means just being cool, not like in a like hip, fashionable, cool sense, but just like having a cool head being having equanimity um, in general in it, like sitting here right now being cool, like interacting with people. Uh, in any capacity, in any situation, being able to be cool. And to me, the postures of yoga are really a vehicle to be able to help cultivate that ability to, to maintain your equanimity throughout life, because it's been my experience. And, you know, maybe this is just, maybe it's not everybody, but it's, I, I don't think I'm the only one who, um, I had a tendency to self-sabotage by letting my emotions get the best of me sometimes. And I didn't even know I was doing it. And so, you know, my Instagram is Brentasana um, because not because it's like it's about postures, even though that's probably the majority of the pictures, because Instagram is a visual medium and, and whatever. But for me, it's just about Brent pose. Like my pose is to, is a it's a practice of trying as much as possible to maintain my equanimity through all the highs and lows, whatever comes my way and learning how to do the, the actual advance that will be it the physically challenging postures, let me say, um, it 
I guess my experience was that it really required a lot of equanimity mentally because it really pushes you up against your edges to be able to get your body to do things that it's never done before that requires a level of strength that needs to be cultivated, a level of flexibility that needs to be cultivated. There's an immense amount of discomfort. There's an immense amount of mental sort of uh, a tendency towards escapism, just wanting to like, I can't do this. I don't need to do this. I, I don't want to do this. But being able to just hear that, observe it, and stay, and stay a little bit longer. And then maybe once that feeling subsides a little bit, actually go a little bit deeper. And, you know, when I first started practicing, uh, you know, the physical practice, I would see people doing things like pressing into handstands or, you know, touching their feet to the back of their head. And I was like, how are they doing that? You know what I mean? I couldn't even, and there was a part of me that was like, that's not possible for me. I, I like, I didn't believe it, but then I would keep practicing because I was, I didn't let that voice stop me from doing the best I could. Right. I was all I was interested in. I was in competition with myself to do the best that I could. And little by little, I would feel myself developing strength and developing flexibility. Like I have distinct memories of the first time I was able to hold a forearm balance or I was able to drop back from standing into a wheel pose or being able to hold a handstand. I mean, I, I don't know how many thousands of times I tried to kick up into a handstand before it finally was like there. And those, those moments were super important because it was like, oh my God, it's possible. And if that's possible, what I thought was not possible, what else is possible? You know, and so that would lead me to just keep opening my mind to new possibilities and staying curious, exploring. And it was, you know, I think I talk about this in the, in the series, the importance of the breath with all of that, you know, just being able to breathe calmly and fully, no matter what's going on, because that's really the thing that's going to help you build equanimity. And as long as you can stay equanimous, you can stay curious, you can keep investigating rather than, you know, um, responding to that um, or reacting to that voice that says, I can't do this, or I need to get out of this, or whatever it is. I mean, obviously, there are times when you do need to get out of something, but breathing slowly and deeply allows you to do that in a conscious way and be like, okay, now I have, you know, I have done what I I've done the best I could, and now it's time to release, as opposed to that feeling of like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I gotta get out of this, I gotta go, ah, I can't do it, ah, you know what I mean? So it's that difference of just finding the ability to relax and be okay wherever you are and recognize that just because something's uncomfortable doesn't mean it's wrong, um, and that more things are possible than our minds might want to let us believe. And I, on some level, I think that's a protection mechanism, because once you start realizing what's possible, it, there's a responsibility on some level if you want to be and do your best and realize your potential, you have to work hard constantly, right? And it's much easier on some level just to be like, eh, can't do that, so I don't have to work that hard. You know, <laughs> It's like a get out of jail free card on some level. Um, and I think, you know, one of my favorite teachers, uh, Donna Farhi, I don't know if you've ever read any of her books, but Bringing Yoga to Life, she talks about that. She talks about stepping into a larger life and um, the amount of responsibility that comes with that and how on some level it's easier just to remain, for lack of a better word, small. Um, and yeah, so advanced asana is, encompasses all of that. It's a journey. It's not just about you know, being in a position where you're touching your feet to the back of your head or doing a deep splits or whatever it is. It's about the whole journey of understanding you know, the mental and physical um, sort of dance that goes on and how to how to navigate that in a way that is beneficial to you as a human being. Um, you know, everybody has different inherent capacities, I think, and um, not everybody is going to, nor should they be able to do every posture. There's certain postures that I don't even want to do. You know, I can't, even, I think it's called Kapilasana, where you take your leg so far behind your head that you can then wrap your other arm around that leg and bind your hands together and your foot's over here. Like no desire. I don't want to do that. I like, it's not interesting to me. And it may be my body could do that, but I don't want to, I don't want to find out that it doesn't want to do that the wrong way. You know, I actually met a guy, I was on a retreat years ago 
And um, he had a very advanced Ashtanga practice um, when he was younger. I think he was probably in his early 50s when I met him. And we got put together as roommates on the retreat and we were talking. And um, he told me that he had hurt his back really badly at one point. And he told me he had done it doing that pose. And so, you know, I could tell that like he, it still bothered him that he, he had hurt himself like that. And so I said to him, um, well, do you feel like um, you were surprised that you got hurt or do you feel like uh, you pushed it too hard? And he paused for a long time. And finally he said, I probably got a little greedy. And it was just like, yeah, I mean, that tendency is, especially if you're a type A person, Ashtanga, you know, appeals to that kind of personality. And I have that in me. Um, so it's like yoga has taught me to be aware of that and recognize that that can be helpful or it can be really self-sabotaging, depending on how you, um, you pay attention to it or not. So I don't know, I feel like I'm rambling a little bit, but um, advanced asana is different for everybody. You know, for some people folding forward and, and learning how to touch their fingers to the floor is an advanced asana and that's totally legitimate and valid um you know and i would say that if that's where you are or if there's you know some relatable situation where something that might seem easy to someone else is really difficult for you just honor that that's the truth of your body and your being and there's something for you to discover in exploring that edge i don't know what it's going to be I, I doubt anybody else will know what it's going to be um it's just about the individual journey of you know, going up against that discomfort uh, and dealing with whatever the mind is doing that want, that may want to hold us back from doing the best that we can do. Thank you for all of that. That was so beautiful. And I, I think about all of the things that I've said over the years of what a strong practice such as this can teach us. And it is that imbuing of a level of confidence that isn't about being overly confident out in your life, but the confidence to really be able to navigate whatever it is that we face. I think about years ago, Travis and I were coming home from a retreat in Thailand and we got hit by a monsoon and flights were canceled and the island was flooding. And anybody that knows Travis knows that he's got an insane karma with water. So just trying to avoid that at all costs. But it ended up being this 60 hour journey home. And when we got to one of the airports where all flights were being canceled, there was this man who was screaming at the ticket counter and I'm sure it was hard that he probably had to repurchase flights for his family. But I mean, the guy was just losing it and the kind of losing it that's scary because of the person who's receiving that, but simultaneously scary for that person's health. Mm -hmm. And you know, the impact that that's probably having on their heart and their hormone levels. And I think so much of this practice teaches us, wow, when we're working toward these postures, whatever they are for each one of us individually that we find uncomfortable and challenging. If I can do that on my mat, I can be in this situation where I'm sitting with somebody receiving a diagnosis. I can be in a really unfortunate travel situation that I'm finding incredibly challenging, a transition in a career, um, you know, and that that really becomes the, the teacher um, and what it is we're learning. So the advanced asana isn't the thing that's that we're learning on the mat. The advanced asana becomes the life pose, the life posture, which I think you so subtly and beautifully end up speaking to in the dialogue throughout the course of teaching your classes. So this new series that's coming out, it's made up of five brand new 45 minute classes. And I think the way that we're having people do it is that they're going to do one class Monday through Friday. And so it's going to be a strong practice each day of the week. And I got to witness you creating this series. And one of the things that I want to encourage people is that, you know, Brent moves at such a sustainable pace, you know, in teaching these classes, it's not about blowing out muscle groups. It's not about overly fatiguing anything. It's about building toward this specific place. Are there any particular peak poses or postures that you want to give us a preview into that you're building toward that, that can get people excited about what to expect? Oh man, there was so much. I mean, I think one of the most fun things for me about that series is that with every peak posture, there's kind of another peak after that. So like one of the peak postures was forearm balance, 
but then there's the funky forearm balance after that. Um, so there's just, you know, there's always another level. Um, but I think it's, I'm really glad you emphasized that working at a sustainable pace. Um, and I would say, you know, if you, if you are interested in, in doing this series and you, um, you know, you get into it, um, make it your own. You know what I mean? Like notice where your weak spots are and get, you know, get playful. Like, one of the things that I think one of the breakthrough moments for me when I first started practicing was just kind of taking ownership of my own practice and not constantly relying on being led by another teacher. I was lucky to live here in LA where I had a lot of great teachers and I could learn different things from everybody. But then at some point, you know, I kind of would just get on my mat and start exploring. And it occurred to me one day, I'll never forget. It was like, well, we hold triangle pose for a long time. We hold, you know, warrior one for a long time. We hold you know, X, Y, Z posture for a long time, but we're always just blasting through chaturanga. It's like chaturanga to up dog and back to down dog. How come we don't hold chaturanga? Because it's uncomfortable, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and because a lot of people, you know, they tend to like get discouraged when they realize they can't do something. And so it became part of my practice to deliberately spend time in the postures that I noticed typically we wouldn't spend a lot of time in and just see what would happen if I did. And then it became part of my practice as a teacher to figure out ways to try to encourage people to stay with something a little bit longer. Like for people who have done the determination practice, there's the five minute plank at the end of that one. And um, it's so gratifying, you know, how many people have reached out and said, I never thought I could do that. But, you know, the way you talked me through it and the way you encouraged me, it, it made me realize I can do more than I thought I could. And so with this wild yoga series, you know, even if you can't end up doing right now, uh, the, the peak pose of each practice, um, do the best you can and try to understand, you know, what's holding you back physically or mentally or both from being able to take another step forward and, and do yourself the favor, have the discipline to you know, work on the thing that you need to work on, whether it's you know strengthen your shoulders or your your pectorals, or you know whether it's you know learning how to breathe deeply when you're in a really intense situation, or you know whether it's getting over your fear of falling when you're in inversion or something like that. Um, just paying attention to where your uh, where the weak links in the chain are, and using you know the things that I'm offering in that sequence in that series rather to. Uh, help you come up with creative ways to address those things on your own. You know what I mean? Uh, just because, you know, I or Lauren or Travis or any of the other teachers, you know, have certain things that we do certain ways doesn't mean that there aren't other ways to do those things or to investigate things beyond what we offer. And so I think it's really, um, it's important in any yogi's journey at some point to be able to just kind of, uh, find your own practice, you know, that's inspired by the things that have been given to you by your teachers. Um, but eventually just listen to the teacher inside. Uh, one of the things that I, I had a moment, I guess I should say years ago that was informed my yoga practice before I ever started practicing yoga. I was learning how to skateboard and I came to this late in life too. I think I was like 31 or 32 years old, but I just decided I wanted to learn how to skateboard one day. So I got a skateboard and then, you know, there's a move called an ollie where you like hop the board up off the ground. And so I was um, in a neighborhood and, and there was, you know, there were, there were no cars going by and there was a sidewalk and the sidewalk was maybe that high. And I wanted to learn how to jump from the street to the sidewalk. Like people who ride skateboards can do that, no problem. But when you're new on a skateboard, that's a huge mountain to climb. And so... I would like, you know, I think I was watching YouTube videos to try to figure out how to do it. And I was, you know, trying to figure it out. And then at some point I realized I need to just pretend that I'm the first person to ever do this. And I need to figure out in my own mind and body how to make the board jump off the ground and get up on the curb. And um, <laughs> along the way, I was, uh, so I was in a neighborhood here in, here in LA where there, there happened to be a lot of um, Hasidic Jewish families. And there was an old man walking around who, you know, he had the big black hat and the long robe and the curls and he's walking by and I completely ate it right as he was walking by and I fell on my back and the skateboard, you know, went sliding away. 
And he looks at me as he's walking by and he goes, try again. <laughs> and he just kept walking. And I was like, yeah, that's what it's all about. Try again. And it was the very next time that I, that I got it. And so it's really like that with yoga postures. There's, you know, you're going to fail, you're going to fail, you're going to fail, but there is no failure. There's just trying until, you know, you figure something out. And then there's trying again and again and again until you figure something else out. And eventually you put the pieces together to take steps forward. And whether it ends up looking like the way someone else does it or not isn't important at all. What's important is that you feel accomplished um, in your own efforts and practice to be able to understand what you're capable of. And what I hear you saying in that is this reminder to not give your power away. You know, I think, especially for those of us that might be type A, it's like we're looking for the teacher and the teacher is going to have the advice and they're going to know the trick or the insight. And we think that the answer is outside. And it's this reminder that, you know, don't give your power away so quickly, especially when it comes to the body and retrusting intuition and, and using your inner facilities as your own ground of experimentation. So thank you. And there's so much to look forward to in this series. The series is coming out next Wednesday, July 5th. So that'll be everybody's new content that you'll get released that week. All the classes will come out on that Wednesday. So you'll have all of that to look forward to. And then later this year, we're going to be creating with Brent. Brent's going to be creating an advanced asana section of the online teacher training for Inner Dimension Academy. So that's something that people will also have to look forward to building upon this series. If you're still, if you do this series and you're like, oh, I still want more and want to get into the philosophy and some of the conversations behind that as well. And, you know, just before we jump into some, some Q&A, I think one of the things that's so inspiring to me, Brett, with your path is the leadership role that you've taken on and taken ownership of in terms of creating your nonprofit, um, the Association of Yoga Professionals or AYP, and, you know, talking a little bit about your vision for AYP and, and, and where AYP is headed. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I think after... I was teaching for probably, I don't know, six or seven years. And I just started to hear a lot of um, sort of dissatisfaction in the yoga community from I don't, the existing sort of governing body of, of yoga, let's say. And, um, you know, it became clear that yoga is something that continually evolves uh, and has ever since, you know, it, it first came into being thousands of years ago. Um, and, and that's that's a good thing, you know, because it needs to evolve in order to meet the needs of the society of you know that it's practiced in. And society keeps changing. The you know the things that we're dealing with keep changing, and so yoga needs to evolve. And you know, it, it became clear that there's a lot of uh, teacher trainings out there that, um, frankly, a lot of people seem like they were doing just because it was a good business model. Um, they cared more about revenue than they cared about quality instruction. And so, you know, there's a lot of places out there that will, you know, sort of run people through a teacher training, like, like, you know, grist through a mill, and they don't really care if they come out on the other side, well trained or not. And as a result, you know, you've got all these different styles of yoga and all these different people teaching um, all these different things. And I think this is kind of what happened on some level before the yoga sutras came into being, because you know, if you if you read about some of the history of yoga, um, you hear about how there were all these disparate practices in India. Some people were sitting and breathing. Some people were walking on broken glass. Some people were hanging upside down from trees. Some people were, you know, laying on beds of nails. And they considered all of these things yoga practices. And there was a lot of confusion, like, well, what, what actually is yoga if it's all these different things? And so then Patanjali came along and he wrote the Yoga Sutras and sort of codified it into like, yeah, you can do all of these different things, but this is the reason to do all those things. This is what you're aiming for ultimately. And I feel like um, I wanted to create something that would create a standard uh, that would raise the standard for what's expected of someone who's considered a yoga teacher and also create some system of accountability because currently, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like the, the standards are not too high and nobody's really checking anyway, if anybody's paying attention to those standards. It's kind of like, just send us your fee and well, you can call yourself certified if you do the hours that your program says. And so I wanted to create a system where there could be more of like a gold standard where people could recognize, oh, if they're trained, if they're certified through this organization, then that means they know 
X, Y, Z, because there is a science behind how yoga works. Um, it's not just sort of random postures and, uh, you know, a little bit of philosophy about yamas and niyamas. There's a whole system to it. And there's a lot of room for creativity in, in how it can be presented and how it can work for different people. But I do feel like, you know, similar to a doctor, um, there are certain things that a doctor needs to know if they're going to be licensed by the state to practice medicine or a lawyer. I mean, it's the same thing. They call it a medical practice. They call it a, a legal practice, right? This is a yoga practice. And if you're going to teach yoga, I feel like there are certain things that people should be accountable to know. And they can get creative with it from there if they want. So all of that said, I created the AYP as a way of offering a certification that has a standardized test, which I recognize, you know, is not a perfect system by any stretch. But the idea is just to start working towards uh, raising the bar for what's expected from yoga teachers and hopefully get some people who are really serious about teaching and want to be distinguished for their knowledge and their experience to be recognized uh, in a way that previously wasn't available. So that's what the AYP is all about. Beautiful. Well, thank you for sharing. And um, Christy, let's open it up to some some questions. Yeah. I see that we have some in the in the Q&A and maybe yeah, you had some definitely. that were submitted or if anybody's here live who wants to come on and show your face, we'd love to see you. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So we have a couple of questions. Um, let's see. The first question. I work in investment banking, but have been teaching on the side for about four years now. Nothing brings me more joy, but I do fear transitioning to teaching yoga full time. Were you, Brent and Lauren, scared to leave your full time jobs? Or did you think that the did sorry, did you think that yoga teacher wasn't re reputable enough of a career based on social family expectations? It's a great question. Can I take this, Lauren? <laughs> okay, so uh, when I first started, when I wanted to start teaching yoga, I went, like I said, I went to the woman who owned the studio uh, where I took those first three classes. And uh, in addition to asking her if she knew about the training program that I was interested in, um, I asked her how you make a living as a yoga teacher. And I'll never forget, she goes, oh, you don't. <laughs> she said, you either have another job or you have somebody who supports you. And I mean, I thought to myself, well, that's not going to work for me. I didn't, you know, get into it with her. Um, but I realized that I needed to figure out how to make a living as a yoga teacher. And um, I guess I should say, at the time, I did not have a job that I wanted to stay in. Um, you know, screenwriting is a very um, hit or miss kind of seasonal like you either sell a script and you're good for a little while or you have a dry spell and you're, you know, scraping your pennies. And I was working as a nanny, um, you know, after I, a time, there were like a few months where I wasn't able to sell a script. And so I needed to get a new job. So I started working as a nanny because I thought that was going to be a good way to have time to write. And it was, but I wanted it to be temporary and it ended up going longer than I originally anticipated. So when yoga presented itself as something I could do that could uh, provide me with some kind of income, even though it was small at the time, um, I was excited to not be nannying anymore. So uh, I'm going to come back to investment banking in a second. But what I wanted to say is um, there are very few yoga teachers in the world that I'm aware of who make uh, the kind of income that would be comparable to what an investment banker makes. And so if you're attached to a certain standard of living that requires a certain level of income, then I would encourage you to get really honest with yourself about what's important to you. Um, and if that's what's important to you, you know, then that's okay. You can be a good yoga teacher and teach on the side and derive joy from that and you know, inspire people and, and um, give, give them a meaningful practice while still working as a yoga, uh, as an investment banker. Um, Generally speaking, teaching yoga is a humble life. And I mean, I was in the Peace Corps after I went to college. And so I think I mentioned before with, you know, with regards to asanas, everything's relative. So I lived in a grass hut in Mozambique for several months and I was okay with that. So now I live in a, you know, I live in Venice, which is considered a nice place to live, but it's a humble house. It's a small house. I rent it um, and I'm okay with that. My girlfriend wants me to have a nicer house, but she loves me. So she's okay with it uh, for now. And so, 
you know, it's about figuring out what you need, what you really need in order to be okay with yourself. And, you know, if you've ever read the Bhagavad Gita, and if you haven't, I would encourage you to, but uh, that and many other yoga texts, they talk about the importance of this word renunciation. And it doesn't have to be something that's so austere and, and like depriving life of joy, but it, it really is asking you to get clear with what you really need in order to be happy and healthy. Um, there was a quote I came across a while ago that was, I can't remember exactly, but it said, you know, being wealthy doesn't mean having a lot. It means being happy with what you have, something like that. And, you know, different people have different needs. There, there are different personality types in the world and different people have different values. And that's fine. Um, I feel lucky to be okay with a simple life. Um, you know, as long as I have some clothes that I like and, a, you know, a comfortable place to sleep and I'm able to eat good food and spend time with my family and friends. I'm happy. Um, but, you know, my brother, for example, he has five children and like my life would not work for him. Um, and I get that and he gets that. And so we he, he's on a different yoga path. He's on the yoga path of, of a householder who's not, you know, teaching or practicing asana, but who's doing his best every day to provide for his family uh, through you know, selling real estate in Los Angeles. Um, I, what I wanted to say prior to that was with regard to investment banking, there was a, a guy named John Newton. You, maybe you know his name. He wrote the hymn Amazing Grace. Um, he wrote hundreds of other hymns, but that's the one he's most famous for. And he was, uh, he used to be a slave trader in his early life when he was in his like late teens and early 20s. And he was um, one of the first people from the British Empire who saw up close and personal what the slave trade was really all about, you know, how horrifying it was and how dehumanizing it was. And so he became a minister and started preaching against, uh, he started preaching abolition. And it was hugely controversial at the time, but he was such an inspiring person and, you know, very intelligent and effective at what he did. He was the sort of spearhead of the abolition movement. And there was a guy named William Wilberforce, who was a member of parliament, who was also, you know, he was pro-abolition. And he came to John Newton at one point and said, you know, I'm thinking about joining the ministry so I can join you in your work. And John Newton said, listen, I'll be honest with you. I think you'll be more effective where you are in parliament. Um, and he stayed there and he ended up becoming instrumental in the passage of, of the abolition movement. So all that to say, if you're an investment banker, you clearly have a skill set that is of value to somebody, probably lots of people. And there may be some value in that skill set that relates to your yoga journey. So you have to kind of sit with that. And, you know, it's probably a longer conversation than we have time for right now. But I would encourage you not to be so quick to jump ship um, and, and try to start teaching yoga and hope that it all works out. But rather be realistic about, you know, what your skills are, where life has brought you and, um, you know, what your options are at this point to do something that's satisfying, fulfilling and effective for what your values are, for what your lifestyle requires, uh, and for what your personal happiness needs. Yeah, thank you so much, Brent. That was really enlightening, actually, for I think for everyone on this call. Um, let's see. Uh, another question. So, Brent, out of these groups of asanas, which one do you have to work the hardest for? For example, forward bends, back bends, twists, hip rotation, inversions. Um, and which one are you currently working on right now? So I would say back bends are generally um, the hardest for me. Um, I see some people, you know, they're, they're able to just kind of like touch their feet to the back of their head really like it's no problem at all. And I'm always like mystified by that. Um, so those have required the most effort, I think, to get my body to do things that I've seen other people doing. Um, as far as what I'm working on right now, it's always changing. And, you know, to be honest with you, I, I mentioned this in the, in the upcoming series, Wild Yoga. I have uh, an injury to a nerve called the long thoracic nerve, which runs from your cervical spine down into uh, your serratus muscle, which is a really important muscle. Um, that anchors your shoulder blade. Uh, and so almost everything I've been doing, I've been dealing with this injury on some level for the last three years. Um, everything I've been doing is sort of geared around trying to maintain um, the highest level that I can while working with the fact that my left serratus muscle is basically non-existent. 
Um, and so that is a really interesting challenge for me. Um, and, and I think, you know, I think people want to have an answer like, oh, I'm working on a one arm handstand or I'm working on doing Ekapada Raja Kapatasana or something like that. For me, uh, I had postural goals when I first started practicing. I wanted to learn how to handstand. Then I wanted to learn how to be able to press from a crow pose into a handstand. And once I sort of accomplished most of the postural goals I had for myself, I've never been able to really hold a one arm handstand fully for like a satisfying amount of time. So I would like to be able to do that, but I'm not actively working on that at the moment. What I'm really working on is just trying to understand how to continue to be the best that I can be and not let, you know, the part of my mind that might say, well, you can't do this, that, or that, you might as well, you know, just like stop trying. Like there is like, that exists in me, you know what I mean? And I have to overcome that um, because I know that I'm capable uh, even in spite of having a fairly limiting injury. And so what I'm working on is just maintaining my highest level that I can um, and knowing full well that this injury may never resolve. Um, it might just be something that is with me for the rest of my life. So I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to figure out how to stay uh, content, how to stay happy, how to stay um, useful. Um, you know, in most days, it's not that big of an issue, but there are days when it's like, oh man, I used to be able to do such and such a thing. And I had to work really hard to do such and such a thing. And I didn't even do anything stupid or greedy to like lose that. It's just like life took it. You know what I mean? So um, learning how to be accepting um and learning how to um be grateful really in in the face of having a limitation that i would rather not have <laughs> i hope that hope that helps answer your question yeah thank you um so it looks like we have what time for one more question um what is the biggest misconception you think people have about you about me Oh, well, I'm glad you asked that because that also, I meant to say that with regard to the other question about um, people's perception of yoga. Um, somebody asked me recently what the hardest thing about teaching yoga was. And my answer was that um, a lot of people don't take it seriously. And, I, and that it kind of goes back to why I started the nonprofit um, because, you know, yoga in many people's minds is kind of like this. Um, it's either just a form of exercise or it's uh, kind of this new agey thing that people who are crazy do. Um, you know, people have all kinds of perceptions about yoga. And in my mind, yoga is the thing that's missing from corporate boardrooms, from government, from university education. Like if there were yoga in all of those places, so many of the things that we call problems in our society would evaporate. And so, if you can take yourself seriously as a yogi and understand why yoga has value, not just in terms of physical health, that's immensely valuable. But as I think a lot of you guys know, there are many other ways to practice yoga. There's selfless service, there's um, bhakti yoga, there's jnana yoga, there's all these different branches of yoga. And when somebody really devotes themselves to the practice, it makes you a better person. You know, it makes you function at your highest level. It makes you more aware of yourself and other people. It makes you able to respond to situations more effectively, more thoughtfully. So, you know, forget what other people think about yoga. Focus on what you think about yoga and do what you can to build yourself into the best yogi that you can be to the best of your understanding. Read books about yoga. Seek out teachers who, you know, love yoga and have a long you know, dedicated practice, learn from as many people as you can. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about that. But then you asked me what people's biggest misperception of me. To be honest, I really don't know. Uh, I think when I teach, especially on inner dimension, I, I tend to like get very serious and focused because I'm trying to remember and be, you know, efficient and on point and not waste time because I'm, I recognize that people might watch these videos over and over again. And like, I don't know how other people feel, but I know of certain teachers who like, they have certain jokes that they go to. And like, if you go to class with them, they're going to say that joke every class. And I'm like, are we really hearing that joke again? So I don't want you guys to have to sit through, like, I'm a funny person. I'm actually hilarious, <laughs> but I don't, I'm not trying to offer that side of myself when I'm filming with inner dimension, because I want people to not like, 
have to be in the middle of a practice and be like, oh, he's going to tell that stupid joke again. So, you know, I just, I think that I come across maybe more serious on interdimension than I, um, well, I am serious, but that's not all I am. So like when I'm practicing, I, you know, I'm generally having a very good time. Like I'm, um, I love practicing yoga. Um, it's fun for me. And I, I like to goof around. I'm playful. Um, I think in my, you know, in-person classes, more of my playfulness comes out than it might on uh, interdimension. Um, so if you guys get a chance to practice with me in person, either in LA or on a retreat sometime, I hope you'll do that because it's a lot of fun. Hey, well, thank you so much, Brent. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, and thank you for that. And if, Brent, if people do want to connect with you personally, what's the best way for them to connect with you directly? Um, they can find me on Instagram. That's always a good way to connect. Or uh, my website, brentlafoon.com, has all my offerings, retreats and classes and um, mentorships and trainings and everything like that. And thank you so much for what you said. I remember 10 years into my teaching journey, I'd be at family gatherings and someone would be like, oh, are you still teaching yoga? Like it was a passing hobby or, <laughs> you know, something that was fleeting and that, um, you know, it is interesting the way that it isn't taken seriously until, of course, you know, 15 years in, it is taken seriously. So thank you for that and what you said. I couldn't agree more. Thank you, everybody, for joining us in this conversation and having this time to really go deep with Brent. I'm so excited to share his series with you coming out July 5th, and I hope that you'll support us, you know, as Brent was talking to, there's so many different limbs of yoga. And one of those limbs is karma yoga. It's seva. We offer these conversations freely um, because we want to connect with you and, and the community. And if you feel like connecting with something that's close to Brent's heart, go visit healthebay.org. Heal the Bay is an important grassroots organization that is working to protect marine and coastal life. So you can go and just learn about that organization. If you feel inspired, you can make a small don financial donation or support them in some way, just as an act of seva for having received this conversation today. And I hope that you'll join us next month as I sit down with Michael Prioto on July 25th at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time for our next community conversation as we get ready to celebrate the release of his upcoming series. So thank you, everyone. And thank you, Brent. And thank you, Christy, for moderating. It is always so <laughs> special to share this time. And we look forward to seeing all of you on Interdimension TV soon. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>